Uh, hello and welcome everyone to the fourth webinar of the competition, Open Data Competition EU Data Tone 2020. Um, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Immaculada Farfan Velasco and I'm working in the Publications Office of the European Union, more concretely in the EU Open Data Portal, the point of access of the open data from the institutions, agencies of the European Union. So, um, First of all, I'm going to present, uh, see how is the agenda of this webinar. We're going to have a presentation from uh, four uh, different colleagues. First of all, from uh, European Central Bank, who is going to present the Challenge 2, an, an economy that works for people. The second one will be the World Bank for the second challenge as well. And then we will go for the third challenge, a new push for European democracy. That will be presented by Eurostat and Eurofound. So, very briefly, since uh, you may be interested to know like what's the competition about and how can I apply. So um, the tagline of this competition is innovating for Europe with EU open data. And this is what, we're, what the competition is about. So it's a fourth edition and uh, it's an opportunity for you to show your creativity and your talent, demonstrating also the potential that open data has. You will help Europe achieve important goals set by the European Commission, by the, by the bond laying um, priorities, the different challenges I will explain later. And you will also have the opportunity to win prizes uh, with a total and share and have like claim your share of the total prize found amounting to 100,000 euros. So how can you participate? In case you're interested in uh, this competition, uh, you can apply with uh, in teams, uh, up to four people, and you can apply for one challenge or different challenge, but it's important that it's one proposal per challenge. So uh, the different challenges, I'm saying be as I'm saying before, um, come from the uh, priorities of the new commission, and we have the challenge one, a European Green Deal, challenge two, an economy that uh, works for people, that is the one we're going to present today, uh, challenge three, uh, a new push for European democracy, that we are going to present today as well. And challenge four, a Europe fit for a digital age. So uh, then uh, you we launched the competition the 19th of uh, February. And then from this moment, you have until the 3rd of May to submit your proposal. And that it should be your idea, like a short text explaining what you want to do uh, with your team and so on, with a description. And um, like it has to fit only of these uh, challenges. So if you when if you apply and you are shortlisted, then uh, you will be invited to develop your idea within uh, several months, some months, and you will have the opportunity to present your application uh, within the 13th and 15th of October in the 18th uh, European Week of Regions and Cities in Brussels. So that is like a very very big event, uh, hosting like uh, up to 9,000 people. And where you're going to be able to uh, uh, show your application, the application I'll be working on, and also you will have a final competition on the 15th of October. So then, what are the prices? So if you're shortlisted and uh, you you participate in this final competition on the 15th of October, um, the final uh, ranking of the winning teams for each challenge will have the opportunity to, as I'm saying, to attend the event. And there will be like three different categories, uh, three different places for each challenge. So the first place will be like 12,000 euros, the second place 8,000 euros, and the third place 5,000 euros. So then, um, once having said this, uh, don't forget to submit your proposal for the 13th of May. And uh, also, like just to finish this, uh, this webinar, the purpose of this webinar is to help participants from experts uh, in data to see how they can exploit the data they have, to better understand their data, and uh, to use it for these challenges. So, um, to find more information, you can also find us on Twitter, uh, in EU Open Data and EU in my region. Also with these hashtags, and of course, if you have any question, we're more than happy to to answer what uh, like uh, any question you may have, and uh, you can directly write us to the functional report. So, having said this, uh, this webinar uh, will be recorded, um, and it will be published in the website that we have, EU Datathon, 
2020. And uh, please, if you have any question after my colleagues uh, present, please write it on the chat box you have in the like in the um, in the webex, and then I will place the questions to them. So, okay. Having said this, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then I will give the floor to uh, Per from the European Central Bank. So, I give you the floor. Thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, I am now sharing my screen. Um, could someone confirm that you can see it? Yes, we can see it. All right, thank you very much. So I, I would like first to thank very much the official publication for the invitation for the European Central Bank to join the Euro Data Lund 2020. And we're very pleased to be involved in this important endeavor. My name is Per Newman Anderson. I work as an advisor for senior management at the European Central Bank, and I have worked uh, for over 20 years in data management, data creation, data production, and data science. So within the field of European banking and financial markets, statistics, security segment systems management, big data and communication. I'm also our key editor of the ECB working paper series, and I'm a lecturer at the Good University on central banking policy and transparency. Um, and what I would like to do is have the pleasure together with the World Bank to introduce the second challenge relating to an economy that works for people. And this is very much in the heart of the new president of the ECB, Christine Lagarde as part of trying to reach out to citizens and make our, uh, our statistics and our central banking policies understood by the general public. Um, so an economy that works uh, for people, we have created six different types of data sets that we may believe could be of interest for you to combine with other data, maybe from the World Bank or other sources and generate new insights and idea and also facilitate how to how to make the uh, the statistics talks for itself and be understood by the general public so the first data set of these uh, six data sets that we have is uh, relating to money credit and banking statistics so this is what i've highlighted in yellow here this data contains all the balance sheet information of every single bank in the euro area that is aggregated at the national level uh, provides all the credit so that means the loans the banks are offering to the respective households or to the corporate sector um, and this provides quite a rich details of the asset liability of the banking sector in order to assess uh, what are the bank's balance sheet composure uh, of and, 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 and what are the biggest um, assets and liabilities that, that they have. The second uh, data set is relating to uh, external statistics. Um, so this includes in particular the trade information vis-a-vis -vis other member states and other geographical areas. So what are the euro area balances and trade with other countries like the US and China and Russia and the UK. So you can easily see who has a surplus, who has a deficit, and how the trade is developing vis-a-vis -vis the euro area. Uh, the third data set is what we call the sectoral statistics, and this is very interesting as well because this shows um, who is issuing and who is holding what type of financial instruments. So one could easily see all the debt securities issued by, for instance, the Italian government, and then you can see the share of which other sectors are holding these uh, debt securities of the Italian government. Is it the corporate sector? Is it the banking sector? Is it uh, coming from um, abroad or is it held by um, investment um, firms. So that gives a very good overview of who is issuing what type of financial instruments and who is holding these financial instruments. 
The, the fourth one relates to uh, surveys of households and enterprises, so enterprises same as corporates, uh, which relates to a survey that we are releasing uh, very shortly, uh, but we have already released two previous surveys on individual level of where does the household, so us as households, private people and the corporates, how easy do they have access to finance? So which channels are they using for financing and how, what are the barriers or the enablers to have access to, uh, to finance? And that gives a very detailed uh, overview from this survey of both the assets and abilities and income and consumption of, of, of the households. The, um, the fifth data set is very much relating uh, to the bread and butter, of course, financial markets and interest rates. This is anything that moves in the financial markets. But in particular, the rate, interest rate level that, that uh, the corporate sector, so the co companies and households, us as private people, uh, what are we paying on our respective loans that we can get from the respective banks in the different member states of the euro area? So that is both the volumes of how much, uh, how much volume, so how much loans have the household um, taken out, for instance, for housing purchases, and what are the average interest rates that these households get for borrowing their uh, the money uh, to buy a household, and are they? borrowing in fixed rate or uh, in variable rates, and what is the interest rate level. So that is a, a very a very comparable way of, of looking at interest rate levels for different purposes, depending if you are in the corporate sector or if you're in the household sector. That data set also uh, cons consists of all debt security issues by governments, by corporates, by the financial market, the banks themselves. Uh, how much is issued, how much is held, so both the issuing side and the holding side of, of, of securities. And then we have the yield curves, which is very much relating to what is the interest rate level of government bonds as of three months uh, up to 30 years, where one can easily see the the interest rate, um, so the term structure of interest rates uh, from this uh, duration of government uh, borrowing. Money market rates, so these are transactions um, that banks are borrowing from other banks. The euro short term rate, which is a new uh, daily rate on volumes uh, of what are the rates that banks are lending unsecured to each other on a daily basis. We have a lot of information about payment statistics um, and also on financial integrations. And here there is direct hyperlinks to all the data sources that we have available that if you have an interest, you can, of course, just click on the hyperlinks and then you have access to the respective data. And then uh, as part of the responsibility of the European Central Bank, so we're not only responsible for and monetary policy and financial um, stability. Uh, we also have the responsibility of the largest banks in Europe for the banking supervision. So supervision of the largest 127-ish banks in Europe. Um, and for this supervisory function, we also have now made available data sets uh, on supervisory data both on the balance sheet, composition and the profitability, asset quality, funding, liquidity, uh, liquidity and the capital accuracy and leverage. So this is a relatively new data set that we have made available to the public that then can be, be, be used in combination for other data sets. And then as the last part of the package, um, um, I have then included how you can access the data either directly from our very large flagship database called the Statistical Data Warehouse, uh, which then provides direct access to all the data sets that we make available to the public. Um, or you can navigate yourself through our e or through directly from the ECB website on the Statistical uh, uh, web page 
where we have also listed uh, and explained the statistics that the central bank are producing as part of the official status of an official statistical agency. And then the third, we have um, a website called Euro Area Statistics that are using visualizations uh, as part of easy uh, to explain and easy to reuse visualizations and maps of how the financial market and banking statistics develop across the European area countries. So these are the three channels we would encourage you to use as part of exploring the ECB official statistics that we are making available to the um, to the to the competitors, uh, so also to the to the general public at large. And we very much encourage you to use these data sets, combine it with data sets, for instance, from the World Bank or like, and then try to provide some insights of how um, how the statistics can be easily communicated. Uh, to the uh, to the citizens of Europe as part of creating and of course then also linking the citizens to the central banking world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Per, for your presentation and such a structured information. I'm sure it will be very useful for our future participants. So I we have here. Uh, Two questions, like first of first of them is like if um, this document is going to be available in the EU Data Tone uh, website, and um, I guess so, and it will be available after like with the with the link to the um, to the webinar. Yes, and, of course, we can make it available. Perfect. And then another question is: Is there any complementary documentation on the data sets on the bank's website? Yes, absolutely. Um, so if you navigate, um, so there are three channels, um, uh, how to access the data set. Um, so from each of these three channels, there are data, there are um, further links to the methodology that explains the conceptual work and understanding of the different terms and technology that has been applied as part of collecting the statistics. So this is probably the, one of the most comparable statistics from Euro area member states that exist in, in economics and financial statistics. As every member states, they are implementing and collecting the same type of statistics and using the same type of methodology which we have developed together with the national central banks using the same timetable. So therefore you can easily compare the concepts across country as it's the same manuals and methodology that has been applied across the whole euro area. Nice. So via the website you have the methodology. I've also included it within the, uh, within the different data sets, a hyperlink directly to the methodology uh, as part of accessing the data. So both of it uh, should be available, uh, including hyperlinks uh, from this uh, document here, but otherwise also via directly, of course, uh, the ECB website. Perfect. Thank you very much, Per. Uh, so thank, you for the, thank you for the two questions. Um, <laughs> can I also ask uh, one question, Inma? Yes, sure. Um, per, uh, this year, um, at the heart of the competition is the, to link EU and regional open data, as we are part of the European Week of Regions and Cities. And could you imagine already how we could link European Central Bank data with regional data and what we could create out of it? Yes, I mean, this, this, this would be wonderful. Um, and of course, um, uh, the, what is very interesting is looking at how the financial structures differs across countries because, of course, first how, how both the structures and dynamics, how it works, um, because, of course, that helps us to see how the ECB policies get transmitted through the, the economy uh, during the very the respective channels to the member states. And then, of course, the beauty will be, of course, to try to link this with other regional data 
um, in order to then to maybe uh, see a better overview of how this is then canalized or combined with other data set data sets to the respective regions within the different member states. We do not yet release any regional statistics, but we have the the, the country data um, that we have we have releases that we have released and combining this with some other regional data sets from the European Commission um, and of course also the data set is available at the official publication office in the open data portal or open data uh, set would be very much encouraged. Okay. Sorry for that long answer. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Professor, if there's any, if there's no other question, uh, please, if you have more questions regarding these data sets, don't hesitate to write us to the functional mailbox, and we can just try to help you as much as we can as well. So thank you, Claire, again for the presentation. And now we go to uh, the World Bank. So now it's the turn of uh, Tony Henry, Matthias. So I give you the floor. All right. Thank you. So let me share my screen. All right. Yeah, it works. Okay, great. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Tony Fusion. I'm a data scientist in the uh, World Bank Data Group. So in a nutshell, uh, what we do in the World Bank Data Group is that we try to shorten the path from data to insight. And so we do pretty much everything from data collection in the field all the way for, to, to data dissemination and, and data visualizations. And so, uh, Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, I can, yes, uh, about the, some data set that could be of, of interest for this uh, specific challenge. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about our go-to uh, portal for everything open data at the World Bank. And then I'm going to talk about uh, our, one of our largest database of uh, cross-country uh, comparable indicators, which is called the uh, World Development Indicators. And then I will talk uh, about our poverty and inequality data. Uh, we have one of the largest uh, collection of uh, household surveys and statistics on poverty and inequality in the world. And so I think that would be a very interesting uh, data set to work on this specific challenge. Okay, so the first, uh, I mean, it's not a data set, but it's a collection of all open data sets at the World Bank. And it's a tool called the Data Catalog. So our Data Catalog centralizes all the World Bank uh, open data. So you can have here anything from a simple Excel sheet that was produced uh, during uh, an operation from a, one of the bank's team uh, in the field. And that is open source data that was uploaded uh, there and is available to large database and large data sets like the world development indicators that I mentioned earlier. And so obviously in that uh, centralized catalog, you can find data on a multiplicity of, uh, of topics. Uh, so I think it's a very uh, interesting tool because you can have, you can make a search on, on pretty much um, anything and you will have quick access to different data sets. Uh, so let me just um, showcase what it looks like and how you can. So this is basically uh, the landing page of the data catalog. And so the main tool here is the search bar. So let's say if you're interested in making a search on, on health, which is uh, a hot topic currently. And here we have health and equity already in the search bar. So I'm going to click on that. Um, and then it will return a list of how all data sets uh, related to, to health and equity that is available as, as open data. So you can have everything from uh, survey data, microdata, household surveys, to other type of data sets. And the way it works that you would uh, click on the data set that seems interesting uh, to you. And then here you have a bunch of metadata explaining what this specific data set is about, uh, some information about when it was collected, the, the number of uh, economies and countries that, uh, that is present in the data set, etc. And here you can have uh, direct access to the to the data set. So you can have uh, access to the data, but also documents that can be related to the to that data set. Uh, some data have 
already scripts here. You have Stata scripts that are there um, that enables you to reproduce the results that are there. So you can actually work from there uh, if you're a Stata user and, 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 and enrich the analysis. Uh, and so that's, that's basically how it works. The search bar leads you to the data set with a bunch of metadata, and then you have access to the data and resources. So this is our main entry point into open data at the World Bank. So if you want to make a, a generic search uh, about what type of data is available at the World Bank, this is where you would go. And then you have a bunch of tools. If you want uh, access to that uh, information programmatically, you have a, a Python package that allows you to access the API and a, a R package that uh, allows you to, to access the API. Okay, so now more specifically on the data sets that I think would be uh, of a specific interest for this challenge, I want to mention two. Uh, this one, the World Development Indicators, uh, is the first one. So this one, as I said, is a, is a collection of, uh, of about uh, 1,500 uh, curated indicators on a multiplicity of, of topics. But the interesting thing about this data set is that the information is cross country comparable. And everything is written in the standard format and very easy to access. So if you want to combine uh, information on different countries, um, uh, crossing different type of information, uh, GDP with environment variables or uh, social indicators, then that, that's, a, that's a good way to start because uh, that's a good place to start because you will get um, access to indicators on many different topics and uh, you will be able to, to combine them and, and cross compare them very easily. And then here again, uh, all the data is available via API. And you have a bunch of, of clients uh, for people who use R, people who use Python, uh, people who use Stata, that allows you to uh, really um, easily access that information. So all that information is on the data.worldbank. Uh, uh, and here, again, this is the search bar, and you can uh, easily uh, search for a specific topics. And so here you can see that you have GDP um, in different um, different flavors of GDP, current US dollars, uh, current local uh, currency units, uh, GDP growth, etc. And so you can choose one that would give you access to a visual interface where you can easily see uh, trends. Uh, you can see here uh, a bunch of related indicators and here you have uh, spark lines about um, different countries where you can uh, easily uh, skim through. And here you can uh, download the full data set easily in CSV, XML, Excel file. You can have access to a data bank, which is basically a query tool that allows you to do some uh, cross tabulations. Uh, but I guess for that case, the most interesting uh, thing would be to download the data directly. And then, as I said, the other way to access that information is through the, the API and the API wrappers in, in Python and, and R and Stata um, that allow you to, to, to work um, very easily with that, that information. And finally, uh, I want to talk about PofkaNet, which is our database. Um, I mean, it's more than a database. It's uh, also an analytic tool that allows you to, to reproduce uh, the poverty numbers published by the World Bank. Uh, and here, so this is the source of the World Bank's uh, official poverty estimates. And this database draws over 1,600, uh, 1600 uh, different surveys, household surveys across 164 uh, countries and economies. And so it provides an, uh, estimates on a range of poverty and inequality statistics. Uh, that are uh, computed based on those household survey data. So here, given the topic uh, of the challenge, uh, here you will find a lot of information about poverty, inequality uh, in different countries, uh, and also at the ag ag aggregated level um, world, uh, different subregions of the world, or also at the country level. And here again, uh, you can access that information using uh, our, our Stata clients uh, to retrieve that information via the API. That's actually what I would recommend in that case. Uh, there is 
on the data catalog and the world development indicators that I mentioned um, previously, it's very easy to to download um, the full data set. Here, with that Povka Net analytical tool, uh, the easiest way to access the data is probably to go straight to the API. And you can see that uh, those tools have uh, help pages, pretty nice help pages, where you can uh, you can get started fairly quickly um, to get access to that information. And and that's it. I think that's the the, the two main main data sets where you have a lot of information like, concerning this topic, and then you have the um, the main uh, World Bank open uh, data catalog, which would, could help uh, participants to find uh, other information that would be um, that could be of interest for that uh, for that challenge. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tony, for for your presentation. Um, I actually have a question. Apart from uh, downloading the information by country, is it possible to do it at the regional level or? Only... So when you say, I, I think we uh, generally at the World Bank when we uh, when we say regional level, we uh, we mean uh, sub regional uh, region of the world, so Latin America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, etc. But I, I guess this is not what you have in mind here. Okay. Okay. Is that is that right? Right. When you say regional level, you you you're talking about sub region of, of Europe. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here. Those main data sets, uh, you have information at the country level, so then you can you can aggregate that. Uh, um, yeah, you have the, yeah. The lowest is basically the the country level in the poverty and inequality the database, uh, with some rural and urban uh, disaggregation for some countries, uh, and then we also have some some surveys some surveys that are open source, uh, and then you, then you can have uh, access to. Uh, you can have access to the microdata, the underlying microdata, but it's uh, it gets much harder to. It's not not as easy and as straightforward to use as the, the existing curated database. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Tony, one question yeah. uh, about the usage of data. So you mentioned there's the data catalog and the open data catalog. Uh, is there a specific difference or? So the, yeah, basically, uh, previously the, the World Bank had a, an open data catalog, uh, and now we, we call it simply the data catalog because it's a combination of open and, and official use data. But basically, so it's one one single catalog that centralizes all data uh, at the World Bank. Uh, the thing is, if you're not a World Bank staff, then you have only access to the to the part of that catalog that is open. Okay. So for, the, for the challenge, I guess the, the right word is open data catalog. Okay, cool. Great, thanks. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. Thanks. Okay. And now we go for uh, Eurofan. So, Daphne, I give you the floor. You can start whenever you want. Right, let me just also load my presentation now. Yeah, it works. Yep. Should I go to the beginning? Okay, very good. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting us uh, to give a presentation about the European Quality of Life Survey. Uh, my name is Daphne Arendt. I'm actually the uh, coordinator of the survey uh, methodology uh, management and development uh, activity at uh, Eurofound. I'm representing my colleague Esther Sandor, who's the research manager of the EQLS, but due to the coronavirus, she wasn't able to come. So I'm going to talk today about the European Quality of Life Survey. It's a cross-sectional uh, survey that really covers many questions that are of relevance to um, the third um, uh, strategic priority that we're discussing today then, I guess, for the first time. 
Uh, we cover questions like social cohesion, fairness, inequality and trust, all items uh, that matter to the European citizen when we think about uh, the future of Europe. And uh, as part of the Commission strategy, we're going to have, uh, or the Commission is organizing a conference on the future of Europe, where they're going to really allow citizens to have their say and, and, and to say what they consider important. And I, we thought the EQLS was a nice example of uh, already some information and data there. Um, so I work for Eurofound. Eurofound is uh, an EU agency that's based in Dublin. And uh, we don't only do the European Quality of Life Survey, we actually uh, also monitor working conditions and uh, we also do a survey that looks at uh, how companies organize uh, working conditions and other uh, matters that, that are relevant within the remit of Eurofound. But today I'm going to talk about the European Quality of Life Survey. So on this slide, you really see the main characteristics of our survey. First of all, it's been carried out four times now. It started in 2003, and uh, more or less we carry it out every four to five years, um, meaning that our last uh, wave was in 2016. We target the population that lives in uh, private households, that's 18 and over, and we cover all the EU member states. So at the time of our last survey, we were 28 EU member states. Um, in addition, we also tend to cover um, other countries, candidate countries in particular, but also, as you can see, we included uh, Turkey. Usually the fieldwork period lasts about four months and we need that to interview at least a thousand uh, people in each member state. But in some countries, in the larger EU member states, we tend to also have larger samples. So uh, for instance, in Germany, we interviewed 1600 people aged 18 and over. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to how we uh, design the survey. So uh, it's a random probability sample. That means that anybody living uh, 18 and over and not, uh, not living uh, in uh, an institutionalized setting has in theory an equal uh, chance of being selected to take part in the survey. We do stratify, that means that we select our sample uh, by region and urbanization level. And then underneath, uh, you see what the response rate is. There's great variation in response rates. It's getting more and more difficult uh, to survey people face to face in their homes. So at the moment, the average uh, response rate is 34%, ranging from a very low 16% in Sweden uh, to uh, uh, around 70% in some of the newer or not yet uh, uh, member states where we believe that hesitance to participate in surveys is less extreme. Um, on average, the survey lasts 30 minutes. So uh, why is EQLS data interesting? Here you see the cover of our um, overview report. I think the important thing about the, the, the contribution of the EQLS it, is that the questionnaire is quite broad and it covers all the different elements of quality of life. And that allows us to then really look at what the relationship is to uh, people's personal living circumstances, but also look at what that means for their perception of well-being and exclusion and their trust in institutions and social and political participation. And we really break it down into these three uh, main headings. So we look at quality of life, we look at quality of public services, and then we look at uh, quality of society. And what I wanted to do slightly different from my colleagues is um, to show you how you can actually explore the data from the EQLS in different ways. Um, so the first way uh, that you can look at the data is to have country comparisons. As I said, we cover around 30 countries 
and that allows you to um, see to to group countries together and to see a different uh, differences between these countries uh, um, depending on whatever question uh, you want to look at. So here we're looking at age and life satisfaction and we're showing different patterns across Europe. And as you can see, there's a group of countries where on average life satisfaction decreases in middle age and then remains constant. But there are also countries like Malta, Poland, uh, Bulgaria, where the older you get, uh, the less satisfied you tend to be with your quality of life. And then you see a third group of countries where really there isn't a big difference uh, between life satisfaction scores uh, uh, for the different age groups. Now the next slide that I'm going to present looks is a different way of carrying out uh, country comparisons. So here we show the full range of scores for the 27 member states and then we also show the average for the EU 27. And what we have here is in fact two questions. We look at optimism about um, children's and grandchildren's future against that of how you perceive your own future. And as you can see, uh, in some countries, your own future is perceived better than the future of your children or grandchildren, whereas in others, uh, uh, the opposite is the case. And that's uh, policy relevant information because it also shows you that in some countries, people are really very concerned about the situation uh, in their country. Um, the next uh, um, example is uh, to show you that obviously we can also look at relationships between variables. So what we are showing here is satisfaction levels with democracy. And then on the uh, left, you see that according to optimism about your own future, and then you see it on the right, according to optimism about the future of your um, children or grandchildren. And on average, for all the countries, we see similar patterns in the satisfaction level with democracy. Uh, Denmark, Finland and Luxembourg are the top three. Uh, Bulgaria, Croatia and Slovenia are the bottom three. But the order in which they are ranked is slightly different. In any case, it's an example of what you can do to, with the different variables and to better understand uh, relationships. Uh, the EQLS covers, as I said, questions about public services. And this slide is an interesting way of showing quite a lot of information in one slide because we ask about seven different types of uh, public services from health services to the state pension system. And then what we've done here is we show for each country the mean, so the average on a scale of one to 10, but also where the country ranks uh, in comparison to all the other countries. And then for instance, you see quite quickly that a country like Austria is the ranks first when it comes to health services, ranks first when it comes to the perceived quality of social housing, but it doesn't rank first on all the items. And I think it's particularly interesting to say that some of the countries that perform less well don't necessarily always perform poorly in all the areas, uh, uh, in all the different public services. Then the next slide um, is just to illustrate that obviously you can also use maps. And also we wanted to show you that for all the questions on public services, we always uh, um, try to measure a broad range of assessments when it comes to quality. Uh, and then for certain uh, questions, we also ask about the curriculum and activities. So when it comes to schools, uh, that's what we've added there. And you can see that in Ireland, uh, people are very positive you see the, the extent of the scores uh, on the bottom there. Right, and then uh, this, this slide is a slide that shows EU average scores, but here 
we are looking at how trends develop over time. So we have used here as an example the proportion of people that report bad health by income quartile. And then we try to show how this evolved during the crisis in 2011 and then uh, uh, what happened post-crisis in 2016. And as you can see, uh, um, it tended to uh, go up. So there were more people reporting bad health uh, between 2007 and 2011, particularly in the lowest and the second lowest uh, income quartiles. So again, this is very relevant information because it shows it helps you to identify that uh, um, the talk that the, the finding that we see a lot is that inequality increased across Europe, and this is where you have some evidence of that. Uh, this is an example of where you can see how how the situation in particular countries evolves over time. So this question asks uh, whether your household has difficulties making ends meet. And then we show the proportion that, uh, that say they have uh, difficulties or great difficulties. And for instance, we highlighted Ireland as an example. You can see that it went from 4% in 2007 to 13% at the height of the recession, and then it came back down to 2007, uh, to 7% in 2016. So I think this is uh, the last slide with, res with results. Uh, what we wanted to show you here really is that uh, you can also uh, use the data to explore different situations. So here we wanted to show the urban-rural uh, divide and what we wanted to highlight is that um, uh, the situation in capital cities is, is very often very different uh, to the rest of the country. So, for instance, when you look at the proportion of people that uh, uh, feel uh, um, that they may have to leave their accommodation because they can no longer afford it, so it's a measure of housing insecurity, we see that, for instance, in Brussels, the second uh, bar from the top, uh, the people are much more likely to perceive this type of housing uh, insecurity than in the rest of Belgium. Um, and it's not the case in all countries. So, for instance, if you look at Portugal, uh, um, it's the fifth from the bottom. You see that actually Lisbon doesn't differ from the rest of the country. So this has uh, um, been very useful information to, to help policymakers think about what we need to do to improve the situation uh, of, of, of citizens depending on where they live and what kind of policies uh, would be uh, effective on that basis. So that's uh, uh, with uh, all I have to say about the results. Obviously, the people that are participating in this data song will be uh, a little uh, also interested in knowing uh, what the EQLS data offers and actually is about. Uh, we wanted to stress that it's different from EU SIL and other Euro, uh, Eurostat surveys. Uh, Eurostat surveys are uh, statistical surveys that can be used to, to estimate uh, uh, what uh, the situation is for the population. And we believe the European Quality of Life Survey can complement that information with a more subjective perspective on the situation, perceived situation uh, of uh, life in the European Union. And the, the, the richness of the EQLS is that it combines both types of measures. Uh, we have also uh, used uh, the survey to actually match it with EU SIL so that we could expand our horizon and not only look at the variables in each of the surveys, but actually look at the variables that are asked in both the EU SIL and the EQLS. Similarly, we can do that with our own surveys. So we have, as I said at the beginning, the European Working Conditions Survey, and there we can, uh, uh, that's a survey that interviews only people that work. The EQLS interviews also non-workers. And when you, when you look at things like work-life balance, it's interesting to combine and to see whether the situation is different depending on whether you work or not. 
Uh, last, I should say that our data is often uh, the source of input for other international indices. So the Gender Equality Index at IGA uses information from the EQLS, uh, as does the uh, Active Aging Index from uh, UNESI as examples. Uh, here you will find links, so you, if you click on these, you can open them to all the reports that have uh, been published uh, by Eurofound using EQLS 2016 data. So if you're interested in some of the more specific topics, for instance, people with disabilities, you can click on that report and see what we've done. Uh, obviously, as I said, there's the overview report at the top. That would be sort of a, a summary of the entire situation. Um, I don't think I will go too much into detail, but this is where you will find information about the technical aspects of the survey and also what uh, our weighting design and our sampling design is, but more specifically, what weights we have in the data set when you want to analyze it and for what different purposes, uh, which weights you should use depending on the purpose of your analysis. analysis. If you want to access the data, that can still be done through the UK Data Archive. Um, you need to register and then it's free afterwards, so you can download it in SPSS format. And uh, here you also find links to uh, the questionnaire, very importantly, so you can see what uh, is being covered in the survey in greater detail. We also have various uh, graphs that you may be interested in using. We have data visualization and for any information about the EQLS, you can click on this link. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, Daphne, thank you very much for, uh, for your presentation. Indeed, I think that all this uh, information will be very useful for the Challenge 3, and you push for European democracy, because a way to hear like the voices from the citizens and so on, so I think it will be very useful. Um, so I have a couple, just a couple of comments, no questions from the moment. Um, I would so, have, well, sorry, I would have okay. one question. It's not uh, related to the da your data tone competition, more about how the com uh, commission is working, because I think this is a unique data set in a way. And how is this feeding back then to the commission to make better policies to better uh, influence the life of the citizens? Or is this the case? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, it is certainly the case. It's uh, um, a monitoring tool that we use to, to uh, fulfill our mission to provide policymakers or to assist policymakers in the development of better social and working um, related policies, work-related policies. Uh, we we uh, use the data a lot when we go to the European Parliament or to the European Commission. And when we look at how our, at the impact of our work, we find that uh, our surveys have a high impact when it comes to uh, policymakers in comparison to some of the other uh, work that we do. So I think it's both ways. It's a tool, so people, uh, we as as uh, employees of Eurofound, use it to, prov to to gain a better understanding of what matters and to translate that into policy recommendations for the uh, for our stakeholders and for the policymakers in Brussels. And then more directly, it shows it how the situation of, of European citizens actually is. So the data itself is obviously already uh, a message. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. OK, so. Um, OK, uh, so basically I have uh, comments. <laughs> uh, one is like this, a great value for collection analysis. Um, another one, very meaningful analysis and great fit for both economy that works for people and a new push for European democracy. Yeah, it's true that sometimes like some challenges uh, can overlap and uh, like the information, these data sets that you're providing as a whole, like all the speakers can be in somehow uh, have some interpretation for all the challenges. So um, if there are no further questions, um, I will 
explore this seminar, uh, this webinar. So uh, thank you all very much for uh, for uh, uh, participating. Uh, especially, like, thank you for the speakers for also like giving such a um, really fruitful information. Next week we will have another webinar, the webinar five, next Friday around the same time, and it will be with other like speakers that they will be presenting for the challenge three. There is a new push for European democracy again and for challenge four, a Europe uh, fit for the digital age. Anyway, we really encourage you to uh, write us uh, an email through the functional mailbox in case you have any further questions. And uh, I really hope you have a great weekend and uh, see you very soon.